leadership. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And I wanted to give you a little bit more background as we get started. First, a little bit more background about me and to share with you why Whitney in particular is so special for me and is a part of my background. When I was a young engineer getting started in industry, I started attending Whitney events and I thought I thought it to be a really wonderful source of inspiration and enjoyed it and continued that. And about 10 years ago, I did attend that main conference in Santa Clara and had a wonderful experience. And in fact, the keynote speaker that year was a woman by the name of Marcia Weeder. And she spoke on the topic of becoming the dreamer. Was anybody there by chance at that conference 10 years ago? Just me, so lucky me because. <laughs> Turned out to be a really good experience and she intrigued me. And she got me really thinking. So I had been working in this very left-brained uh, community and business atmosphere and what Marsha brought to the table was this really right brain kind of thinking. Uh, big picture, aspirational, thinking about your dreams. I mean, you think and sit back, when's the last time I really thought about my dreams? And so she did get me thinking about this, and I bought the book, because there's always a book, right? <laughs> you know. And uh, I started reading it and thinking about it, and then I was planning my sabbatical. So I was working for Intel at the time, and what they offer is every seven years, you get a sabbatical, which is two months paid leave, to go out and do whatever you want. So you can go have fun, you can explore a passion, you can rest and relax, which a lot of people do, right? And they also encourage you to even think about what you want to do next and if you want to stay with the company, okay? Because it's intense. And the desire is that people really think hard about uh, what they're committing to and what, what they want to do in the future. And so I was on my second sabbatical from Intel and I decided to go to Marsha Weider's Dream Retreat. It was in Maui, Hawaii, and it sounded like a little mixture of all of those things I said, right? So it's like, perfect sabbatical thing to do, that's where I'm going. So I booked my tickets, I went off to the Marsha Weider retreat, and we did spend a whole week long doing all sorts of things that an engineer never does, <laughs> okay? Reading poetry, talking about symbols, um, watching movies, you know, maybe that's not so out of the ordinary, but she really had some unique ways of trying to dig at what's going on uh, inside of you and what do you really want to do next? Where are you, what are your dreams that we have to dig out, excavate, okay? So I walked away that week with two dreams that I wanted to pursue. One was that I wanted to have a child, a natural child, and my husband and I had been going through a couple years of infertility and struggling through that and uh, we're told by the doctors basically no chance, so you might as well start thinking of some other options. But I figured, you know, we'd be thoughts on a number of things and we're gonna try. This is the dream, right? I mean, it's meant to be something that is, feels a little unattainable, so we're gonna do that. The second dream that I had come up with that, during that week was that I wanted to start my own company. And I wanted that company to be a company that gave back, that made a difference in the world, that created positive change. And so from that was born my company that I'm here presenting on behalf of today, Parish Partners. And we are specialists in strategy and culture and change management and this very esoteric thing called leadership. So the next piece of this pie that I want to try to describe to you is why leadership became a focus area for me, okay? Because I think that everybody has some level of, especially when you're in a corporate environment, which many of you are, some level of exposure, right, to what is this concept of, of leadership. And for me, uh, there's kind of a whole story of a thread of how it came to be something that I wanted to focus on. So first of all, I grew up in Michigan, and for those of you who are familiar with your geography, it's, you know, like right here, near Detroit, okay? <laughs> Anybody from Michigan from the audience? <laughs> Nobody from Michigan. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay, close. Yeah, Midwest. Same, all the same. Yeah. Okay, very similar. So, <laughs> so I grew up in this very large family, a family of eight children, one boy, seven girls. Okay, and seven very strong-willed girls, by the way. So my my brother and my father, they never had a chance. Okay, not with all of us running around. And so I I was not born one of those born leaders. I was born really a gopher, because that's what you do when you're the youngest in the family. I was the youngest, right? You go, go for this, go for that, right? So we grew up in this, this 
this, this uh, big and crazy and chaotic environment. But I always knew that I was kind of different. And uh, I was very analytical, really good at math and science. Maybe sound familiar to anybody in this room? Probably quite a few. And I was told when I was in high school by one of my teachers that if I was good at math and science, that I should consider being and becoming an engineer because there's not that many, there was a need for more women engineers, right? And it was something that I should, should think hard about. And so, you know, back then, that was about all the career advice you got. You got it. So it's like, okay, all right, well, let's go with that one, right? No, but no, seriously, there was a, a, a genuine interest on my part to, to go into this field of engineering and apply those particular skills. And so I was off. I went um, off to the University of Michigan, and I studied industrial engineering there. I loved it because it had also a, a people focus. And, uh, and after my four years there, I went off to industry, and I joined Intel, who was a $4 billion company at the time. And this was just about the, the is really the beginnings of what I would call the internet boom, okay? So there was lots of growth going, going on, and I joined the company in a very exciting time. Uh, it was fast growth, it, it was uh, an amazing pace, and lots of great energy, and the company was investing you know, strongly in their people, it was a wonderful atmosphere. I loved it. I loved working for the company. I loved my job. And after a couple of years, I decided, well, I want to see you, and I want to go into the management roles, right? So um, look into getting my MBA or another master's. And so as I started to think about that, uh, it just so happens that my manager came, came to me one day who knew I wanted to, to pursue my MBA. He came to my office and said, you know, Michelle, if, with a big if, if you can get into MIT, and not just get into MIT, but get into the engineering school, one of the engineering schools, get into the Sloan School of Business, and get into this little program called Leaders for Manufacturing, which at the time was a, a small 40-person program that was designed uh, by industry partners to, to grow, basically, future manufacturing leaders. He said, if you can get into this program, all these programs, then maybe Intel will sponsor you, and if they do, they will pay for both of those degrees, and they will pay your salary while you go to school. <laughs> and I thought, I'm sold. Right there. <laughs> Sign me up. Where do I apply? Right. So I started my application process right away. And the one of the questions that was asked in that essay process, the, the application process, was, "What is the difference between management and leadership?" I was all of 22 years old, and I. I really didn't know. <laughs> I was really um, thinking hard and trying to figure out that answer. And this was the time, by the way, it might have been the start of the internet boom, but Google wasn't around yet. So you didn't just go to the internet and <laughs> up comes the answer. And by the way, just for fun, I thought, you know, thinking about this um, for tonight, I Googled it, what's the difference between management and leadership, and sure enough, boom, you know, our full article, Wall Street Journal, good source and everything, all the differences, right. But back then I thought about it. So it, whatever I wrote, and I don't remember what I wrote, but it must have been good enough because they did let me in, okay? And uh, I spent two amazing years at this, this special program that was focused on leadership, global operations, and basically becoming industry change agents, okay? So it was uh, quite a remarkable experience that I was able to really leverage when I went back into industry. And I went straight back to work for Intel. And uh, I really feel like that in many, so many ways, having studied it, having thought about it, helped catapult my career. Now, it helped also that the company was growing, growing fast. So the company grew from $4 billion to $36 billion while I was there, so over the course of 15 years. And by, at the time that I had departed, I was running a $2 billion manufacturing facility in a Fortune 50 company with about 1,000 people in my organization. And local newspapers were starting to write some articles about this young woman who was making her way in a very male-dominated field. And so all that felt really good, right? I was kind of moving along my path, and I was leveraging all of these leadership learnings. And then something kind of shifted for me. This was the time that uh, I, uh, I had gone through a divorce, I had uh, remarried, started suffering through infertility, and things were changing where I just didn't feel the same passion and drive for my job like I had for 15 years. And it was something that I felt like I had to take a look at because it just didn't feel the same. And I felt, whereas before I really felt on purpose, now I felt off purpose. And wasn't really sure 
what to do, and that's where that story kicks in about the whole martial leader dream retreat and that reflection, that time to sit back and think about well, what do I really want, and how I go, how do I go about going to get that? And I started to to think about how do I use all these leadership concepts that I have learned over the years, over, over 20 years, to help myself, to help lead myself in a new direction, because I wanted to do these things that now I didn't really know how to do, and I had to go figure out how to do them, right? So in my business today, what I love doing in this leadership coaching as a part of my business is leveraging all of this experience um, from over the 20 years to, to help other people figure out how to lead themselves and how to lead others. And I really do think that one's the building block for the other. And if you can figure out how to lead yourself well, then really those same concepts apply. And you can multiply however many people, but it's really, understanding how the change process works. So what I want to do next, before we get into the workshop piece of this, where there's a work part of it, where everybody's gonna kind of get their, their, their minds going and the, the pens and the papers and all, I wanna spend just a minute going back to that question that they asked me on that essay that was so perplexing, right? Which is, what is the difference between managers and leaders? And throughout the years, I finally stumbled upon one definition that I loved that I thought was simple straightforward, it made a whole lot of sense. And it came from a professor at Harvard Business School, and his name's John Cotter, he's still alive today, by the way, you can even link in with him, which I think is pretty neat, because I did that recently. Um, because he's very well published, and has been out there for a number of years. He basically came to the conclusion that managers create order, and leaders produce change. And if you just step back from that and think about it, that is so beautifully simple. And compare and contrast that, by the way, to that Wall Street Journal article, you know, and I thought, okay, this is interesting because this is a long explanation. Manager, but the manager administers, the, the leader innovates. The manager is a copy, the leader is an original. The manager maintains, the leader develops. The manager focuses on systems and structures, the leader focuses on people. And it goes on, so they have this nice long description of, of the difference. And I think that you will, no matter you know whose definition that you really use, fundamentally when you start to look at leadership and how it's taught, it really is that leadership is more about people and the future and how to move things forward, right? To, to move things forward with change. So management skills, that's your planning, your budgeting, uh, <coughs> controlling, problem solving, organizing, staffing, things like that. Leadership, setting vision, okay? aligning people. People, figuring out how to get them to move in a certain direction, right? Motivating, motivating them, inspiring them. It's really a very different skill set. Now they're complementary, and you need both. You can't really separate them, but it's important to be able to distinguish them. And it's important to develop that leadership side, which I would argue is more of this right brain effort. And it's, it's really a whole brain concept, okay? Because you also have to execute and execution, and the discipline behind all of that is really more of a, uh, a left brain uh, activity. But this whole idea of you know, just getting in there and understanding how people tick and helping move things forward, that's a whole nother skill set. And that's really what we're gonna be talking about tonight, okay? And this, this Be More Leadership model that I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail, in a few minutes, you'll understand. But, okay, so you see what we're gonna be doing. The work that we're gonna be doing on here today is forming what I call neural pathways. And so this is the whole idea of what's going on in your brain, that's where we're starting, okay? So, when you feel the leadership habit, because that's what we're talking about, what essentially is happening first, the catalyst is, there's, a, there's basically a little neuron that goes, that fires off in your brain, okay? And starts making this, this connection. So there's this chemical transmission that goes on, electrochemical transmission, and then all of a sudden this firing, and then this neural pathway starts to build, and then as you practice it, like you would practice till the point where you get into a habit, all of a sudden you have this new neural pathway in your mind. And that's what's actually going on when you build a habit. So I thought you should know what's actually going on inside of your brain when we start to make some of these changes. And the catalyst really for that, that neuron fight, firing is something I call a moment of insight. And what a moment of insight is, is basically that, no better term for it than, aha. It's something that you really like, okay, I got it now. Something that just makes you think, okay, I'm, I have a different way to think about this now. And so moments of insight 
was something that I think even Ben Franklin really understood way back when, you know, that people are best convinced by things that they discover themselves. So in other words, it's always best if you can discover something on your own, discover the answer and figure out your path from there, than it is for somebody else to tell you the answer. <laughs> And so fundamentally, the coaching process and what I do is a lot about helping people get to these moments of insight. So they've got now this, this basis to work from to form the new habit. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're with me still. Because here's the next part. <laughs> These are the building blocks. So this is where we're getting a little bit more into how do our brains work and how do we go from unconscious incompetence, which I'll explain in a moment, to habits, which I call unconscious confidence, okay? So unconscious incompetence is basically when you don't know what you don't know. Have you ever heard of that term? Yeah. yeah, good, okay, so that one's getting around. It's kind of understanding that maybe I don't know everything, no matter you know what level you are or where you are in your, your career or your company in the hierarchy is, maybe I don't know everything yet. And in fact, a lot of times when people hire me, it's because there's a manager or a leader who's stuck here in a place where there's something that they don't know that they don't know, but the people around them do. They, in other words, an example, um, maybe somebody who has some struggles with their <coughs> relating to the people around them, right? Maybe is coming off in a very aggressive way and is not recognizing that as an attribute that they have that's really making it hard for people around them to connect and to do their jobs and to move them forward, right? And so if you can't relate well, right, then maybe <laughs> You're not quite able to move everybody forward in, in, in whatever your vision is, right? So you have to get through this unconscious incompetence, this idea of understanding that there might be something that you have to work with, and then move to the next step, which is conscious incompetence, which basically means that you say, okay, I get it, I need to work on something. Okay, so it's like, all right, I've discovered. Maybe there is this, this attribute or this, this leadership uh, habit that I need to, to go ahead and focus on for a while and get better at it, okay? And then you move to the next level, which is conscious confidence. And that's really what we're talking about a lot today is this whole idea of moving from uh, making something, something that you've tried once to a habit. So the way you do it is you practice. And you find lots and lots of ways to practice because when you build those neural pathways and you do it 30 plus times and all, now you start getting good. And when you get really good, you get to unconscious confidence. And that means basically you're doing it now and you don't even realize that you're doing it anymore. It's kind of like the, the driving a car. So you start out when you're 16 and getting your permit and you know, you're conscious of everything and you're, you're not really sure if you're doing everything right, but you reach a point where it all just happens naturally and sometimes you can't remember like I did if I even stopped at the light, right? <laughs> it's like, did I do what I was supposed to do? I can't even remember now. So we're going to be working on this process for you tonight, okay? Probably not the whole way through. Why? Because it's, it can be a long process. But if we just even start here or here and get you started on understanding some things that you fundamentally want to work on, then that's the beginning of progress. And we're going to build towards those habits. So are you with me? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. What we're doing? Okay. <laughs> Great. So what I want you to do now is think about this project idea uh, because Kathy told me she wanted this to be something that was a good takeaway, where you would actually walk out with something substantial for how you would improve your leadership. So what we want to do is take your project, what, whether it's a project or maybe it could be like a challenging relationship, or it could be some result that you're trying to achieve. It could be maybe even a dream that you want to pursue. And I want you to think about that project as we go through this model that I'm calling Be More Leadership because you can apply the concepts to your project and, and have something to walk away with as far as some action steps to get you started, all right? So with that, you, if you open up your folders, there is a sheet in there, and that should be more action plan. And we're gonna walk through each of these areas and make some new discoveries, hopefully some new ahas. I want to describe to you the model a little bit more so you have more context for it. And I also want to give you a little bit more history on the topic of leadership. Because you might be asking me, you know, gosh, Michelle, why do we need another leadership model? There's all sorts of models out there. And there's, you know, hundreds of books and thousands of articles and how many blogs. And, and so, you know, do we really need another model? And I would argue that, yes. We need a new model, a new way of thinking about leadership and why. Because times are changing, because our society is evolving and changing. And not only is 
the society and how we work and how we do business and things like that changing, but also the, the, the demographics are changing. Okay, look at America and how it's transforming itself, right? So we need to start thinking about leadership in new ways. And really, I want you to start thinking of leadership very personally, okay? And that's what we're really gonna get to a lot uh, today when we talk about this model and moving you forward. And so really, if you look back in the 1920s, when the field of leadership first started to be documented and discussed and all, really, it's not even a topic that's 100 years old when you think about it, okay? So in the 1920s, it was always about characteristics. What's a characteristic of a great leader? Like, you probably have some on the top of your head. Anybody? Characteristic of a great leader. Yes? They're able to cast their vision so that the people catch it. Okay, wonderful, perfect, yes. Charismatic. Charismatic, yes, very often used, uh-huh. They empower their people. Empowering, okay, yes, and those, but that one, by the way, tends to be one that has come to light more in more recent years, so that's important, that's an important trait to have. And so really, as we went from this idea of leadership traits so in the 1920s to in the 1940s, the whole idea of like more leadership style. So then it was more about, okay, maybe we need different styles of leadership, and. And instead of you know, an autocratic way of, of leading, perhaps maybe more of a democratic way of being, and that seemed to start resonating because it was a time of Eisenhower and the time of basically this, the, the whole country serving as more of a role model for the democratic process. So at that point, it became more about, okay, everybody needs to be a more democratic leader, okay? And more, you know, maybe empowering, right? And just uh, basically match that style and you're good. Okay, that was the message. So then, Fast forward another 20 years, and it starts to change again. Okay, now it starts to be situational. Okay, all right, stop that. Maybe that's not, democratic doesn't always work. Let's look at, okay, maybe in these situations you need to little, be a little bit more this, and in this a little bit more that, and you know, it just kind of started to blossom into this number of possibilities. The, the idea was that leadership was a situational thing that needed to be assessed, and you need to figure out what you need to do in the situation that you're presented with. And so fast forward a little bit more, and I, I see that the trend is changing, that it's now now just not situational leadership, okay? It's really, what I see emerging is more the concept of conscious leadership. So that you understand what kind of leader that you are, and what kind of leader that you wanna be, and that you're thinking through for the situation, you know, and, and, and traits and all these things, right, that we've, we've talked about, what is it that you're really trying to become? And if you can give it some thought and start to brand yourself, right, as far as, okay, this is the kind of leader that I am, and yes, you might shift and change for the situation, but the whole idea is the leadership is very specific to who you are as a person and who you want to be and what you want to create in the world. And that's the model that we're going to be working with today. It's really more central to who are you as a person and what you want to create in the world. Are your game? Okay, so this is what we're going to move forward with. So the, the change formula, so we talk about leadership as a change process, is this. It starts with awareness, okay, moves on to choice, making healthy choices, and action, and that results in your positive change. And so this leadership emerges through the inquiry, the self-reflection, and then after leading yourself, you can start to lead others. So that's the progression. We're gonna start with this idea of building cultures of commitment. And I want to start with this one because I think it's so fundamental, particularly for whatever project that you're, you've chosen, uh, to how far you're going to go with this and how much improvement you're going to really make and take it is how committed are you to this project or relationship or um, you know, idea that you want to move forward. And I want to read you a poem that's from the, the Scottish Himalayan expedition. And it goes like this. Until one is committed, there's always hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too, and all sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. And a whole stream of events ensues from that decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance, which no man could have dreamt would have come his way. So when I read that poem, what do you, what do you get out of that? What meaning does that have for you? Does anybody want to comment? OK. 
sometimes when you make a decision, things just unfold because you've made that crystal clear commitment, commitment to yourself and yes. things just start to gel. That it's coming from some greater depth, right? That, that it all of a sudden, it's more when it's more meaningful to you and you really decide it's important, that's when things start moving. And one of the first things that I always figure out when I'm working with, with clients, uh, particularly the ones that we're working on, this un unconscious um, incompetence, is the idea of what are you really committed to? Because what you're really committed to is what you're going to make happen. And commitments are something that you have to seriously think hard about. And so I want you to start thinking about those tonight. List some things on a piece of paper. You've got some notepads and things in front of you. List some things that you just might be committed to. You don't have to decide yet if you're deeply committed and if, if, if it's something that you're for sure looking for, but some things that you might be committed to. Maybe other people are asking you to do it. Maybe you've been grappling with it, thinking maybe this is something I should do. Just jot them down. We're just gonna take like 20, 20 seconds to do this. what you're committing to and what you're going to make happen. 
And if it's really not that important, then take it off the plate, right? You find something that is meaningful to work on, that you can get yourself rallied around, that you can get your team rallied.